Good morning, muffins. Wow, new avatar. So, if you have consumed enough content in physics, you might have heard the following statement. Atoms cannot exist in four spatial dimensions. But why? As of me making this video, there's no video on the tube at all on this topic. Surely, physics still works the same when you just add one more number to all your vectors, right? Well, it turns out it's more complicated than that. Firstly, recall what an atom looks like as you have learned it in school. Negatively charged electrons orbit a positively charged nucleus according to the laws of electromagnetism, just like how planets orbit stars per the laws of gravity. Then we learn that, well, actually, this is wrong, because if it is the case, since electrons experiencing acceleration will emit electromagnetic radiation and lose energy, it will lose more and more energy and finally fall into the nucleus. So actually, they form a cloud of density around the nucleus because of our Lord and Savior quantum mechanics. Well, hold on to that for a bit now. At the same time, you might also learn that for both gravity and electromagnetism, the force of attraction is proportional to 1 over the square of the distance between the two bodies. So you might think the force of attraction just works the same in higher dimensions. Well, actually, that would be wrong. So why does gravity and electromagnetism follow the inverse square law in the first place? Here, we'll directly cite this law discovered by our pal Carl Friedrich Gauss. Gauss law. The net electric flux through any hypothetical closed surface is proportional to the net electric charge enclosed within that closed surface. Now, at this point, I'm pretty sure this statement has zero meaning to anyone outside of physics or electrical engineering department. So I'll explain it in, in YouTube English. The charge is easy. It's just the value of the electric charge of the thing inside the surface with the plus or minus sign. Then the electric flux through the surface is just how much pulling power, well, or yeeting power if the charges are the same, our nucleus here can exert on the entire surface. As the size of a 2D circle expands, its perimeter increases proportional to the radius. In 3D, the surface area of a sphere increases proportional to the square of the radius. Then in 4D, the surface area increases per the cube of the radius. I uh, have no way to animate a 4D sphere, but here, if we unfold a tesseract, we get 8 3D cubes, just like how unfolding a cube gives us 6 squares. So the surface area of a 4D object follows the third power. So as the distance or radius grows, the same amount of pulling power will need to spread over a surface area that grows proportionate to the square of the distance. So the pulling power at any single point on the surface decreases accordingly by r square in the denominator. Then in 4D, when the radius of the sphere grows, guess what happens? Well, so in four spatial dimensions, the inverse square law actually becomes the inverse cube law. This continues for five, six, seven, and higher spatial dimensions. Now, let's talk about potential. My physics professor also once told me I have a lot of it until he yeeted me off the window and it was all converted to a kinetic energy. Here you can see the higher up we are, the more potential energy coming from the Earth's gravity pull we have. And if friction is ignored, the total amount of energy anything has is kinetic energy plus potential energy, which stays the same unless there is any external input and output. And, and yes, hitting the ground is an external input. Now, if we have a smooth surface and an object like this ball here, it will also roll down the hill to lose its gravitational potential energy until it is at a stable state in a valley. Turns out any electron in 3D works pretty much the same way. They naturally want to slide towards locations with lower electromagnetic potential energy. Intuitively, the steeper the slope at a point is, the more the ball is going to roll down that direction of max descent when it's on that point. Now, at any point of this landscape, the force that nudges us towards the lower height is exactly the slope of the landscape at that point. And note the negative sign, since the force should go down the direction of the slope, not up. So in three spatial dimensions, the electromagnetic potential energy function exerted by a nucleus on an electron is given as proportional to minus one over r, 
r being radius distance from nucleus. If you take the negative derivative at any point, the slope will give us that familiar 1 over r square. This will give a vector pointing towards the nucleus, which is exactly the strength and direction of the electromagnetic force. Likewise, in 4D, the potential energy curve will be some constant times minus 1 over r square. Now, these are obviously not full arguments as I've been hand-waving more than a Toronto traffic cop in my explanations, but this is basically how the math works out. Now recall again, the reason why electrons don't snap into the nucleus like those magnetic beats is quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, as you might know, everything is a probability distribution. A particle can be in different locations until you measure its precise location. Now, I should note that we're now getting into the extreme hand-waving territories. Most of the stuff I say from here on are watered down and definitely not how actual physicists present the relevant math equations. But even with this level of distillation, there is still a lot of calculus gibberish. So really, don't worry if you can't fully follow. All you need to do is absorb the overall ideas. Formally, a particle exists as a position wave function mapping spatial location to a complex number. And if you multiply it by its conjugate, it gives a probability distribution of where you can find it and by what probability. The integral of that distribution over all of space must be equal to 1, as you should always be able to find that particle somewhere. Just like how classical objects move along a potential energy field, how a wave function changes over time is dictated by this differential equation. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand them, uh, it takes me years too. Here, there are these two terms, kinetic energy and potential energy, just like what we learned in classical physics. The solutions of this differential equation forms a set of basis states, where any physically possible wave function is a linear combination of them. You know how every sound wave can be separated into a combination of sine waves using Fourier transform? This is the same idea. But note that different potential energy landscapes have different basis state sets. These basis states each have an associated total energy. All other possible states are linear combinations of them and will have a weighted average as its total energy. Now, any particle will want to spontaneously lose extra energy until it sits at the lowest energy state, also called ground state. So, let's say you have some wave function. Its shape is not important. If you calculate its integral, you will get the expected value of the kinetic energy. It is the average kinetic energy of the electron across the different positions it can be in. Now, imagine we shrink it in space by a factor of lambda. And you better remember this from high school. To squish a function horizontally by a constant lambda, we multiply it to x inside the function. Note that the wave function also needs to be taller to still have a position distribution sum up to 1. But here, the kinetic energy integral have the same form. So this kinetic energy operator has a second derivative. Turns out it doesn't matter how many spatial dimensions we live in, it will still be a second derivative. Here, we just look at the radial term of a spherical coordinate, but still, the actual math works out the same. Now, look at what happened when this is applied to our scale wave function. By the chain rule of derivatives, we can pull out the constant twice. Now we have lambda squared times the original expression for kinetic energy. And in case you wonder, the constant for renormalization cancels itself out after integral by substitution. So what happens is, if we shrink the wave function by lambda, the kinetic energy goes up by lambda square. In other words, the mean kinetic energy of the electron on average at r length units away from the nucleus scales by 1 over r square. The potential energy is, as mentioned, some constant times minus 1 over r. And if we also shrink the wave function like above, the potential energy integral still goes by minus 1 over r. So, in 3D, the total energy of the electron wave function will go by some function of the distance to the nucleus like this. We plot it and you can see it has this minimum here. And this on our y-coordinate is the energy of the ground state. Side note, in actual quantum chemistry, you will also see a negative number like this. 
from the ground state, you need this much extra energy to raise the electron to zero potential energy, where it's free from the pull of the nucleus. Moreover, this distance here on the x-coordinate is the mode of the position distribution in the ground state, meaning the electron is most likely this much away from the nucleus if we measure its position. And if you plug in actual numbers and solve the equations, you will get the Bohr radius, the most probable distance between the nucleus and the electron in a hydrogen atom in its ground state. Now, look at what happens in 4D. The kinetic energy operator is still a second derivative, so the kinetic energy term still scales by plus 1 over r squared, but the potential energy is also minus 1 over r squared. Thus, they factor together as just one constant times 1 over r squared, and there's no divot or local minima for a ground state to sit in. Mathematically, if you solve the differential equation, you will also see that. For any valid solution, there will always be another solution with lower energy. Cite a source here if you want to torture yourself. So in 4D, an atom is either fully ionized, or the electron falls into the nucleus, losing more and more energy, but never grounding. And practically, the electron will keep getting closer and closer until it snaps into the nucleus and merges into a neutron. And in five or higher spatial dimensions, the minima becomes a maxima, since now the minus sign part is of a higher order of 1 over r. So, yep, that's why atoms, and subsequently all of chemistry and biology as we know it, can only exist in 3D given our current system of physics. Hope you enjoyed the ride. Now, of course, if there ever is a 4D universe, they probably have completely different systems of physics to still create complex life. But that really, that's a story for another time. If you like the video, give a like. If you don't, leave a comment telling me how I can improve or what you want to see next. Subscribe if you want to see more. See you nada!